entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. I put this in the entropy seminar. <laughs> the results of the first. Blah, 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 blah. Why is that? That's because entropy is is one of these really weird concepts. Okay, it's actually a quite deep. Um, we don't go into so much detail in the IB class. Uh, in a way, thank goodness, because there's a lot to it. But we can mostly say that it's uh, the measure of the amount of disorder of the particles in a system. That would be a, an accurate enough uh, version that we need for the IB at least. And it's a really, really strange quantity, okay? It's something that we use because it's not reversible. See, most processes in physics are reversible, but because this one isn't, it seems like things overall in the universe seems to just increase in entropy. So that means that, you know, that might be a way to tie, for example, what we're going to call the second law uh, into, you know, basically the direction of time or even, you know, the fact that why we have life on Earth. And I think a general thing uh, to think about is this, that the warmer the object, remember things are going faster and they're more chaotic, so there's more entropy, there's more disorder, and a colder object has less entropy overall. Now let's start by concentrating on the equations that we need for this. So macroscopic, so on a larger scale, things like thermal energy or temperature, then we have this equation here, it goes delta S equals delta Q over T. So now, what are these different uh, variables? Well, delta Q, we know that one is a change in thermal energy, so that must be in joules. We have T, which is a temperature, which will be measured in Kelvin. So what will entropy then be measured in? Well, it'll be joules per Kelvin. So that's why we're going to measure entropy in joules per Kelvin. Okay, and that's a more straightforward way. However, there's a, a little bit of a stranger version, okay? It's this microscopic version, and we say it's the number of microstates. So we assume that all the probabilities are equal, and we can use uh, something like combinatorics, for example. And this will get a little bit weird, but let's first show you the equation. And remember, entropy is still going to be measured in joules per Kelvin, okay? And we've got this equation goes like this. Okay, so that one just goes entropy, so S equals, and it's a Boltzmann's constant times a natural log of this uh, omega, which is the number of possible microstates. So that seems like a, a kind of a strange one, and actually we can look at that in a second. Okay, so we've got, uh, for example, let's say we have a box of particles, and on the left side there's two particles, on the right side there's eight. So keep in mind, in the total, total, uh, there's ten particles, but we're basically saying, hey, how many different ways are there possible to, you know, choose two on the left side with eight on the right? Remember, these particles can be individual, so you can swap them out. So how can we actually solve this? We can use something called combinatorics. Okay, so now that, it depends on which math class you're taking, right? Because not all the math classes have this. That's why this might be a little bit tough if you had to find this right here. I just want to show you at least what the equation is and see uh, what it is. So this is what we call N choose R. Okay, and this is the notation we use, N C R like this right here, and it's related to factorials. And it goes like this. It's N factorial over R factorial times N minus R factorial. Now what is a factorial? That's when, uh, let's say it's like 3, 3 factorial would be 3 times 2 times 1. 9 factorial would be like 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and so on. This right here is a generic equation right here. So if we, in this case right here, are trying to do 10, choose 2. See, we've got 10 different particles, and we're trying to arrange two of them, then we would put them in this equation like this. We'd say, well, it would be 10 factorial, divide that by uh, 2 factorial times 10 minus 2, all that factorial. Well, let's see. First of all, uh, what is 10 factorial? That's 10 times 9 times 8 times 7. Now, those who have seen this a lot in math class, you'll realize there's actually some steps you can skip, but I just want to show you all the steps here. So we go like this, and all that will be divided by, let's see, what's 2 factorial? It's just 2 times 1, so that's just 2. And what's uh, 10 minus 2? That's 8. So that means 8 times, oh, it's 8 factorial. So it's 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And good news in a way, can you notice a bunch of stuff cancels out the 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 or whatever, all that cancels out this one. So we end up with just 10 times 9, which is 90, 
divided by 2 is not what we have. Yeah, we have 2 on the bottom. That means we just have 45. So we can say, hey, there are 45 microstates possible. And there's 45 different ways of arranging two particles from a box of 10 of them. So that would be what we would put in, for example, for this uh, omega here, this symbol omega. We would say that right there. So omega would be equal to 45 microstates. Okay, so now let's talk about the second law of thermodynamics. And we've got three different formulations that are actually pretty important. So first of all, second law, the Clausius version, says that energy can't be transferred from a body at a lower temperature to a body at a higher temperature unless work is done on the system. So what does that really mean? Well, I could say this, that the energy, it doesn't like to go from cold to hot. See, so remember, it prefers to go hot to cold. So that's one version. Now, this another version of a second law is called the Kelvin uh, version. So this would be, we would say, energy can't be extracted from a hot object and transferred entirely into work. So what does that really mean? Well, what it means is there's no such thing as 100% uh, efficient heat engines. Now, another way to say that is, you know, you can't have a perpetual motion machine. So something that just keeps doing its motion forever and ever, there will always be some losses. And because of that, they, you know, a machine, if you leave it by itself, it'll always eventually, you know, stop working. So that's an important second one here. And we've got second law, the entropy version, which says that the entropy of the universe tends to a maximum. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the entropy of the universe will increase over time. So if you leave it long enough, even though entropy might decrease locally, overall in the universe, things will increase always. That's why we call this an arrow of time. So again, just to reiterate then, so most physics laws are reversible. So for example, you know, energy or for example, you know, motion or acceleration, things like that. Lots of things are reversible, but not entropy. It seems it goes one direction. So because of that, you know, some people think that, well, entropy then must be you know, related to the arrow of time. I've got a few different examples. So do you know what a Rubik's cube is? It's like, you know, this cube where you can sort of twist it and move it around. So what can we say about entropy there? So we could say that, you know, well, there's only one way to have it fully solved, you know, where all the colors, for example, maybe it's like, you know, blue, then orange, then red or whatever. There's only one way to have it all solved. But, you know, there's a quintillion different ways of having it unsolved. So do you notice then, you know, it's a lot easier if you just mix it up, for example. As long as you're mixing it up, you're always going to have uh, more chances of it being disordered. Now, why is that? Because as you mix it up, you increase the entropy. Okay, so that was pretty important. That's sort of how we can deal with a Rubik's Cube. Well, what about a sandcastle? I took this picture actually of my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter. She made a nice sandcastle, right? Well, that's another example of entropy. So, of course, you know, as a sandcastle, as it's built as a sandcastle, that has lower entropy. You know, there's, there's only one way to have the sandcastle kind of built. But if you leave it over time, you know, water will come in, your wind will come in, uh, just, or just gravity will take over. And it'll sort of crumble and fall apart because, again, we're increasing the entropy. So this is also really important. And again, just to reiterate, in both cases, this one here, as you mix it up, you increase the entropy. So you notice that's a formulation of uh, the second law of thermodynamics here as well, right? If you leave it long enough, of course, the entropy, the disorder of the system will increase. So can the entropy decrease? Well, yes, locally, you know, temporarily, sure. But overall, the entropy of the universe will always increase. So how can this be? Remember I said hotter means more entropy, cooler means less entropy. So what about the air condition at a house? You know, how could that be? Well, I mean, you are in decreasing the entropy locally as you cool the room, sure. But the problem is, is that, you know, this pump that you're using, it's going to, you know, uh, heat up more than it actually cools the room. You could also say, you know, for example, the power plant that was used to generate the electricity or the pump itself, those heat more than they cool. Another example could be, for example, life. You know, we're great at increasing entropy. And why is that? Well, I mean, we eat, you know, for example, a low entropy orange. Imagine I have an orange in my hand or something, and it's, it's very ordered. And, of course, what do I do? I eat it, so I break it up in different pieces. I spread out that energy into our bodies. I radiate that back out into the atmosphere as heat. I basically, I've increased the entropy of the universe overall. So, see, life, we are great at actually, you know, increasing entropy. So although entropy is a weird concept, just remember, though, um, that the, I, this main idea is that it increases over time, sure, and we have some equations that can help us out as well.